Good morning, everyone. How does it feel to be in the new sanctuary? Yeah, yeah. Big round of applause for all that uh, worked on this. Uh, they've got, uh, I mean, we've had a lot of volunteers to work on this uh, sanctuary to get it from, you know, where it was to here. And I don't even know what it looked like, but, you know, uh, it looks fantastic now. So uh, would you stand and worship with us today? Welcome, welcome, welcome to Valpo Baptist Church. We're so glad to have each and every one of you here today. Just a couple quick housekeeping things. If you're visiting here for the first time, thank you for visiting us. At the info desk, you can grab a Connect card. Fill that out for us. It's the best way to get information about our church into your hands. So we encourage you, please, please, please fill that out. If you're watching online, you can go to valpobaptist.churchtrack.com and fill out the same guest card right there on that site. So uh, if you're also visiting here for the first time, the facilities for the restroom are right outside here. So if you go out to the back and hang a right, you'll find those facilities right there. But we can't thank you enough for visiting with us, and we hope that you'll join us again. But let's continue and sing. Let's stand together, and we're going to have a great time of worship this morning. We have come. 
You are here.
Boy, it's been a good morning already, hasn't it? Yes. Praise God. Man, it's wonderful. Uh, the singing was terrific. You all sounded wonderful. Man, it's, it's nice to have a church that can sing, you know? <laughs> It'd be bad if we were standing up here and you guys weren't good at singing, but you guys do pretty well. <laughs> so we're going to be back in 2 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. I am so glad to be back with you. Kelly and I had a, a relaxing vacation. Uh, we went out and had a, a family wedding that we went to in Kansas City. And from there, we went and did a little bit of hiking up in the mountains out there in uh, Washington State. And we really enjoyed just being able to rest and relax. So thank you as a church for that opportunity for us to do just that. But with that rest and relaxation came an excitement about getting back here. Man, can you look around the room at how full this is? Unbelievable. We stacked as many chairs as we could get in here with fire safety in mind, all right? And, uh, and man, this is terrific to see this. So, you know, just be praying for us as we figure out how to best maximize the facility here. I'm sure we'll have conversations about that in the coming days. And so anyway, we're going to be looking at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's begin with a word of prayer as we continue on. Lord, we're so thankful for the opportunity to come and gather and worship today in your house. Thank you for each and every person that is here today. Lord, we pray that as we come here today, that Lord, we would open up our hearts, our minds into what you would have us to know and what you would have us to do as we live out scripture. And so, Father, we ask this all in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Today's sermon is entitled, Watch, Listen, Obey, and Repeat. All right? So two weeks ago, we spoke about worldly religion. Hopefully you'll remember that. And we talked about how worldly religion was grounded in all of the wrong things. It was grounded in a love for self, an unhealthy love for self, an unhealthy love for money, and a love for pleasure rather than God. And the saddest part of it all is that it really came down to misplaced affections. That ultimately... You know, people had misplaced their affection. They loved these other things more than they loved God. And the saddest part of it all is that they thought they were a part of the fold of God. The people that Paul was teaching about really thought that they were believers. And so Paul had assessed that kind of religion. He said, listen, they have a form of religion, but they deny its power. And that religion was worthless and in vain. And then at the tail end of the passage, uh, here's what he says in verse 9. Paul says that they will progress no further and their folly will be manifest to all. And so, you know, two weeks ago it was kind of a discourse on what not to do right? Scripture usually gives you two different things, the what to do's and the what not to do's. Well, two weeks ago, it was a what not to do. But today, Paul is changing his discourse from this topic of worldly religion. And now, instead of doing the what not to do, he kind of changes the tone and he starts to tell us what we ought to do, the to do's, so to speak. And so Paul pivots uh, in this passage and he's going to describe what it looks like to have a genuine real walk with Christ, what that looks like and what it takes for us to actually do that. So this morning we're going to learn as we look at a, le um, a title that I've entitled, Watch, Listen, Obey, Repeat. Okay, that's going to be the sermon title this morning. Watch, listen, obey, and repeat. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to pick up in verse 10 this morning. I'll give you another minute to get there. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 10. All right, here we go. In verse 10 it says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium and Lystra, and what persecutions I have endured. And out of them all the Lord has delivered me. Yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things that you've learned and the things you've been assured of, knowing from which you've learned them, and that from your childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through a faith that is in Christ Jesus." 
Now, this passage speaks a bit about persecution, of course. It talks about the persecution that Paul had endured, and it also talks about the coming persecution uh, that will happen to those that live out their Christian walk. But I think embedded even deeper into that passage is a model of discipleship, if you will. It's the type of discipleship that Paul lived out in his life. And so I'd like to take the time today to discuss this issue of discipleship. Because I think it's critical for any growing church. And praise the Lord, I believe that we're a growing church. You know, we've been growing, we've been uh, adding people in. But if you grow without roots, you're missing the point. Right? It's not about numerical growth. It's about spiritual growth. And so we have to talk about that as well. And sadly, too many churches forget about discipleship. Or if they do think of discipleship, they reduce it down into a six-week, you know, class. Right? A, a quick little class where maybe you learn some doctrine, a little bit about the church, and then boom, you're a disciple now. And we put like that rubber stamp of approval and assume that everything's good. But listen to me, that was not at all how Jesus modeled discipleship. Nor was it the way that Paul modeled discipleship. True discipleship cannot be simplified or reduced down into some sort of six-week seminar or study. It doesn't work that way. Discipleship is a lengthy process that happens in the everyday stride of life. Discipleship requires that we're in the relational place where we can start to influence people for Jesus Christ. And that only happens when we spend quantity and quality time with other people. Think about this. Would we all agree that Jesus was probably the best disciple maker that ever walked the face of the earth? How many would agree with that? Okay, right? For those that don't agree, let me introduce you to Jesus. He was the greatest disciple maker that ever walked the earth. So now you know, all right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He was the greatest disciple maker that ever walked the earth. And think about it. He spent three years... Three years pouring into his disciples, right? It wasn't some sort of an overnight process. It wasn't some sort of a process with a rubber stamp uh, of approval, right? So to assume that we as a church or we as a people can disciple somebody quicker than Jesus himself, we'd be sadly mistaken, wouldn't we? That's just not how that works. And so what does it actually take to make a disciple? What kind of relationship do we need to be in? Well, Paul gives us a sneak peek in this passage about how to go about this process of discipleship. And the long story short is, it's not easy. It takes time, energy, and effort. Paul had Timothy walk through a series of four movements. That's where we get our title. Okay, four different movements when it comes to discipleship. And I think that all four of those are profound in their own way. And it'll help us as we start to influence people for Christ in this process that we call discipleship. First, I want you to notice that Paul had Timothy watch. That's the first thing that Paul had him do. And this is so key. If you don't listen to anything else this morning, at least listen to this. When it comes to discipleship, more than anything else, we have to be an example to those that are watching, right? More than anything else, we have to be an example. You see, the best way for people to learn is if it's right in front of them, if they can see it right there. This week, uh, we had the, the Tun family in, and little Haley was playing on the piano over there, plucking the keys, and I went over and showed just a real quick refrain. I showed her how to do it. She went back and repeated it right after I showed her. Do you know how she picked that up? She watched it. She saw it right before her eyes, and it was a model for her to follow. And so that's what it takes, right? And so anyway, we should never be in the position of saying, do as I say, not as I do. If we're in that position, then we become that hypocrite that Paul talked about two weeks ago. But rather, we should confidently be able to say with Paul, hey, imitate me, as I imitate Christ, right? That's what Paul said back in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. I'll read that passage for you. Matter of fact, I'm going to back up to chapter 10, the very tail end of the passage. Here's what he says, starting in verse 31 of chapter 10 in 1 Corinthians. He says, therefore, whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 
Give no offense either to the Jew or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they would be saved. And then you go right to that next chapter and he says, so imitate me just as I imitate Christ. So notice what's going on here. In the passage, Paul starts by giving a little bit of practical wisdom. He says, hey, listen, everything that you do needs to be done to the glory of God. That's a pretty practical piece of advice. But notice, he didn't just say it, he lived it. Right? He didn't just say it, he lived it. Paul, after he gives that imperative command, and whatever you do, do it for the glory of God, he then said, if you want to know what that looks like, imitate me as I imitate Christ. In other words, he's saying, listen, by the grace of God, I'm going to show you what this looks like. And so that is where it's at. Friends, if we have any hope of influencing those that are around us for Jesus Christ, we have to live a life that's worth imitating. If we don't live a life worth imitating, nobody wants to follow that, right? Nobody would want to follow that. And so the world is watching us whether we like it or not. We mentioned two weeks ago that, man, they are good at sniffing out hypocrisy. If they see any hypocrisy in our lives, man, they are going to run as far away from that as they possibly can. But if we live a life that is worth imitating— if they can see that there's a real deal going on there in our life, then man, we can start to have some influence. And I want you to notice the areas in which Paul was an example. Pick up in verse 10 one more time in our passage. In verse 10, he says, you have uh, carefully followed, and notice all the areas that Paul influenced Timothy. You have carefully followed the idea of watching my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my perseverance, my persecutions and afflictions and what happened to me at Antioch and what persecutions I've endured, but yet through them all the Lord delivered me. So notice, Paul is saying that he spread his example or extended it to every aspect of his life. Timothy was a front row seat to everything that Paul went through. And so by the time that Paul had wrote Timothy, this was at the tail end of, of his life. So they had spent a lot of time together. Timothy had watched as Paul taught he and others doctrine. He had watched as Paul conducted himself, uh, you know, well in every aspect of life. He had watched as Paul had a purpose to his life, and that purpose drove him to his every move. He had watched as Paul gave grace to those that had wronged him. He had watched as Paul extended Christ-like love to others. You know, Timothy was able to share in Paul's struggles, to talk about the hard times, but also to celebrate in the good times, right? In every single aspect of life, Paul was an open book to Timothy. Timothy was able to take a front row seat and take it all in. And that is the aim, right? We have to, at the end of the day, disciple those that are able to watch as we live life. You cannot disciple somebody that you're not in close proximity to. Let that sink in. You cannot disciple somebody that you are not in close proximity to. And for that matter, neither could Jesus. I know that sounds like a, a surprise, but everybody remember the story of the rich young man? That was a story where this man comes up and he asks Jesus a question, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life, right? And Jesus gives him the, you know, he, do you know the commands? And he goes, yeah, I know the commandments. In fact, I've kept them since I was a young lad, you know, goes through this whole gambit. But then at the very end of it, Jesus said, okay, there's one thing you lack. Sell your possessions and come follow me. Did that man take Jesus up on that invitation? He did not. He loved his possessions too much and he walked away. You see, that invitation, come follow me, echoes the same invitation that Jesus gave to every other disciple, come follow me. But the rich young man was unwilling to follow. And so Jesus, as a result, couldn't disciple that guy. He wanted to, but the guy was unwilling to follow. So it, it just makes sense. It stands to reason that we can only disciple those that are in close proximity to us. And so invite people along in the journey. If you're a leader of any sort, invite people along to witness as you serve. Don't serve alone. Listen, 
Never do ministry alone. You have to invite others that can watch, that can learn, that can develop alongside of you. It's of the utmost importance. And I say that knowing that sometimes it's easier to do ministry alone, right? It's hard to develop a lesson plan and invite somebody to come and, and learn with you in that process of developing a lesson. It's hard to go on a hospital visit, to go visit somebody in need by yourself. Or, you know, it's hard to get somebody else to come along with you to go on that hospital visit. But if you go by yourself, you're missing the point of discipleship. You're not discipling anybody if you do ministry alone. And so I promise you the benefits far outweigh the inconvenience of inviting people along to watch as you do ministry together. So friends, we cannot grow uh, disciples. We cannot grow new leaders unless we are in proximity with those that we want to disciple. So that begs the question, who are you inviting to watch you as you serve? Who are you inviting to watch you as you serve the Lord? Have you brought others along for the ride, or have you been flying solo? And in the process, you haven't discipled anybody along the way. Paul invited Timothy to watch. Then, secondly, notice that Timothy listened. In verses 14 through 15, pick it up with me again in the passage. Verses 14 and 15. Paul says, you must continue in the things that you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, that from childhood you may have known the holy scriptures, which were made, uh, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And so notice, it's important to be an example, but there's also an element of teaching that's embedded in discipleship. You see, we can't, you know, only show the way, we also have to teach the way. It goes hand in hand, right? Showing and teaching have to go together. They shouldn't be separated. There's two really far extremes in the discipleship world, right? There's the air of classroom discipleship where you think that, you know, you just, you just teach somebody something in a class and then there's a lack of showing it. Or there's another side to that where you err on the side of practical service and you show and show and show, but you never teach. You never have those tough conversations that are needed. And so friends, sometimes as we're discipling people in life, sometimes people need to hear a timely word. They need to be challenged in certain ways. They need some inspiration that needs to be shared in their life. And you can't do that if you don't share some words here and there, if you don't teach somebody something along the way. And so here, uh, here's how it all ties together. Okay, when you live a life that's worth watching, when you live a life worth imitating, you know what that, you know what that does? It opens the door for us to be able to speak into the lives of others. When they see that you're a genuine Christian, the real deal, when they look up to you and say, man, they have a Christian life worth following, what that does is it starts to open up the influence we have to be able to speak or to teach into their lives. Because, listen, don't we all open up our ears towards people that we trust, right? It just naturally happens. We'll open up our ears to the people that we trust. And so when we trust those people, then difficult conversations can ensue. That's when we can start to make an influence, uh, start to make an impact on people's walk with Christ. And we know in the passage here that Paul had those kind of conversations with Timothy. Why? Because it, it's implied right here in the passage that they spoke about life. They spoke about doctrine. They spoke about love and Paul's forgiveness. They spoke about the, the uh, affliction that Paul went through, the, the hard times and the good times, right? It implies it because he says, listen, you have to continue in the things which you have learned, right? Timothy couldn't have learned them unless he was taught them, right? And so he says, listen, you have to continue what you've learned and been assured of knowing from whom you've learned them. And so what's really powerful when you start to think about it is that Timothy was willing to listen and to learn because of the influence that Paul had garnered in his life. And so once again, it begs the question, who is listening to you? Who have you been teaching who do you have that has opened up their ear because they've seen you in action? They believe you to be a genuine Christ follower. And as a result, they've opened up their ears and they are listening. 
Who have you been influencing for Christ in a meaningful way? You see, first we have to show them the way, but then we have to speak into their life in meaningful ways because both are needed. I'll give you an example of that. Just the other week, you know, this was a process for my friend. He's, he's a good brother in the Lord. We love each other. And he was starting to get bitter about a church situation that he went through in his own home church. And he would call me because we would discuss life together quite often. He'd call and he'd start to rant, you know. Well, can you believe this? Can you believe that? Blah, 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 you know. And he would just get bitter and bitter and bitter. And every time we spoke, you know, I would say, you know, you really need to talk to the other person about that, you know. It doesn't really help to vent to me about this. You need to go and talk to that person. Go have the conversation. And I would say it over and over and over. And finally, it sunk in, and he went and had that conversation. And you know, after he had the conversation, he said it was like a weight was lifted off of his shoulders. You know? But who else was going to have that conversation with him? Sometimes we just need somebody to have a timely word to say, you know what? And this is what I told the person. I said, you know, at this point, the whole situation is on you, not on the other person. And he was like, he was like, you know, taken aback because he's like, well, they're the ones in the wrong. I'm like, listen, they cannot address a wrong unless they know there is one. And you failing to talk to them, you know, it, it puts it on you because they don't even know. You have to have the conversation, you know? And sometimes when we have that kind of a mentoring relationship, a discipling relationship, I can say something difficult like that and it's taken well. It's received. And that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about. So Paul had that kind of relationship with Timothy where Paul was able to speak into his life and Timothy was able to listen. But then there was one other thing here. Notice that Paul wanted Timothy to obey. Okay, look at that uh, four essential words right there in verse 14. You must continue in. You must continue in. For Paul, it wasn't enough just to model things or to teach things, but rather he wanted to see action, right? It was implied that if Paul was going to show Timothy the way and he was going to teach him the way, then Timothy needed to also walk in the way, right? It was this idea that it was implied there would be obedience with this teaching. And that's the whole point of discipleship, really, isn't it? Think about the Great Commission. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, 19, and 20, Jesus teaches us this. It says, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey all that I've commanded. And lo, I'm with you even to the end of the age. So the passage is all about discipleship, isn't it? Jesus says, go make disciples. So it's about discipleship. And then Jesus lays out what that actually looks like. He says, first, baptize them. Well, what's baptism? Baptism is the first step of obedience in our faith, right? It's the very first step that we take in obedience to Christ because he commanded it. Go make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then notice that last part of the Great Commission. And teach them to observe or obey, right? Let's try that again. You didn't convince me. Teach them to observe, observe right? Or obey, okay? Right? It all comes down to obedience. And quite frankly, it's hard to claim to be a Christ follower if our lives don't resemble him at least a little bit right? I mean, how can we claim to be a Christ follower if we're not in obedience to what he has taught us? And so in essence, he's telling Timothy, listen, the proof has to be in the pudding. I want you to continue to do these things, right? Keep on living the way that you ought to. It wasn't enough just for Timothy to watch Paul as he served. It wasn't enough just to listen, you know, or to, to lend an ear to Paul. But rather, he says, Timothy, I want you to do what it is that you've learned. And when we disciple others, I think there needs to be some evidence of action, are we actually influencing and growing the people that we are discipling? If we don't see any more semblance of Christ in their life, then something in that process has gone wrong. 
There's a cog in the wheel, if you will. And so we have to ask that question. Are they growing more and more into the image of Christ? And if not,